Okay, folks, the hour is upon us. So I'm gonna ask everyone except for Mike to please mute your uh, microphone so we don't have any ambient noise. Um, so we get a good recording of this because I know this is gonna be important to our church um, in, in uh, weeks and years to come. So we're so excited to have Mike Patton teach Church Architecture 101. He and his wife, Megan, have been uh, members of the church for uh, over 30 years and um, just wonderful, beautiful members. Um, Mike is a retired architect. Um, he was with Clark Nexon in the A&E firm, um, and his area was higher education uh, for Virginia, so he worked a lot with college campuses. So. Um, the church architecture is something more of a love of his, not not something that he he um, did in his occupation. Um, he's done a lot of research for this class, and I'm just really excited to to hear what he has to say, as I'm sure all of you are as well. So um, I'm going to ask you again: be sure that your uh, microphone is muted. Um, Welcome everybody. This is very strange and that I've never spoken to a group I really can't see. Um, very different. As I started working on this, one of the things that I quickly realized was that this topic was huge and I, you know, could probably put together a full semester on it. So what I've tried to do is just narrow it down to a few things that, you know, I thought were important and um, were interesting to me and might be interesting to you. I would recommend now is a great time to go get a cup of coffee that may help keep you awake as the slides come up and it gets really boring. Um, so um, you may need some caffeine. Um, I am gonna stop my video so I'm look at some of my notes and the different stuff I've got here to talk. Um, so I think I'm gonna disappear. So just to start in the beginning, um, the for the first, 300 years after Christ was crucified, um, there were no buildings. There was nowhere that everybody met, um, you know, or, or practiced. I mean, mainly because Christianity was illegal. Um, there were very few, you know, buildings or anywhere where anybody could get together. And it's my understanding in the beginning that um, a lot of the Christians um, worship along with the Jews um, in the synagogues, but as they started to separate um, more and more started meeting in people's homes. Um, these meetings were often done secretly or mostly done secretly. Um, these homes became known as house churches and most occurred in large houses of the wealthy where there was room to get people together. Because if you think or know anything, you know, back in that day, people lived in one or two rooms, the whole house. Um, so it was very restricted. Th these, um, it's also mentioned in Acts that um, church meet that um, there was a church meeting in the house of Mary, um, the mother of Mark. Um, so it's in the Bible where they talk about these. The oldest, not changing. Uh, sorry, I'm having technical difficulties. Um, the oldest buildings that we know of um, that were used solely as a church were um, in Duras, Europas in Syria. Um, this structure dates back to 235 AD. So um, about 235 years after you know, Christ had been crucified. And the building was basically a house in the beginning like so many were. And it had a, a one larger room that functioned as the meeting room for the church. When, when the building was excavated um, they also found frescoes um, that are some of the oldest that we know of. Um, these ancient Christian paintings show the Good Shepherd, the healing of the para paralegic, paralegic, the Christ and Peter walking on the water. And um, it's the earliest known depiction, depictions of Christ that we've ever found. Um, and um, it's kind of sad to say but um, the fate of this, what's left of that building is unknown. Um, but um, from what I could gather off the internet, it was probably destroyed by ISIS. 
and um, is probably gone forever, which is just, just sad. Um, the good news was that when Yale University excavated the um, site, they actually took the frescoes back to their museum at Yale. And so the, the frescoes are um, at least here for future generations to see. So moving on, when, when, um, when the Roman Emperor Constantine seized power in 312, Christianity became lawful and um, it was okay to, you know, to meet and get together. Um, under Constantine, Christi Christianity became the privileged re religion of the Roman Empire. And as the faith grew and spread around the Mediterranean, buildings used slowly, solely for Christian worship began to spring up. Um, the architectural style of these first buildings were exact copies of Roman civic buildings, basically the Roman Basilica. Um, they became the model for the church. Um, the Roman basilicas were, were large public buildings. They were typically built alongside the forum in Rome and other places, and they were used for courts of law or meeting spaces or markets. The basilicas were typically rectangular in, um, buildings with a central nave flanked by two or more aisles with a roof that um, usually was in two levels. They had an asp at one end, which is, which is sort of a radius in on it, and usually contained a raised area in that area where the Roman magistrate would, would be. Um, the apps became known as the area where the clergy sat after we started adopting these buildings um, and building them for churches. Um, with the pagan basilicas, um, there was often a statue of the emperor in the space, but as Christian basilicas um, typically would have the Eucharist in them, um, a symbol of the eternal love of, um, of God was put into the apse. And as you can see, um, you know, the proportions and shape of this building, you know, could almost be first prose. The oldest um, plan that we know of was, was St. Peter's, that, that is just a um, pure copy of a Roman basilica. The Basilica of San Clemente was one of the first churches in Rome. It was built on top of a fourth century basilica that was originally an Aristocat's house that had been converted into a church. Um, there's thought that, that in the basement of that house that was on the site um, in the fourth century, that actually they had held services in the basement of that um, house, maybe as early as the first century. I mean, it may be one of the first places that we know of where, where, um, church, where church groups were gathering. You know, and many of the churches were built in Rome right over houses where the Christians worship. Some of them, um, the Roman early, early churches were built over where Christians were martyred or actually the entrance to um, the catacombs where Christians were buried. A lot of times they would um, start a church there. The first very large um, churches um, was notably um, San Giovanni and um, San Megliore. And my Italian and French just laugh or, you know, Santa you know, Maria Maggiore. Thank you. My wife will handle this. Um, they, they were built in the fourth century. Notice the interior of, of um, the um, San Maria and, and how similar the proportions and the shape and the side aisles and everything to our church. I mean, over you know, a couple thousand years, it's interesting how, how similar these buildings have stayed and how little um, has changed. While the ornamentation and the decorations may have changed, the basic layout's been the same for Catholic churches forever. Um, the other thing that stayed the same and was copied from Roman architecture, um, besides the building shape, was that um, most of the churches had an atrium or a courtyard with a colonnade surrounding it out front. Uh, many of these had disappeared as the land and towns and cities became scarce. Uh, many turned into cloisters or public plazas. Um, you know, like the, the um, Basilica at San Clemente. And um, 
they're, um, while, while they're, they're pure Roman, I mean, the, every Roman building or every basilica in Rome had these same, or all over the Rome, you know, Roman buildings all over the world had the same um, layout. And so everything that came, um, that, or it is our church architecture, really came from the, you know, as I keep saying, the Roman basilica. Um, you can see here, um, St. Peter's, you know, has that colonnade, has the big public space out front as any basilica would have, along with St. Mark's, you know, which, you know, two of the biggest ones. But these were both just copied from, from basilicas. So from the fourth century onwards, churches sought to construct buildings that were both permanent, but they, you know, wanted to be aesthetically pleasing as well. And this required congregants and, and town leaders to invest huge amounts of money and, and hundreds of year in time. Um, the amount of time that was spent constructing these buildings and especially the cathedrals in, in Europe, the, the big ones, just, just really amazes me. You know, I used to get bored working on a project that might extend two or three years because it had gone on hold or whatever. But, you know, when I'd have to pick it back up or get back on it, um, I'd be bored after like the first year working on the same project. I mean, a lot of these people, especially the, you know, the people, you know, building them, they would spend their whole life working on a single building if you were a mason or whatever. And so would your kids. I mean, you, you might be building a building that you would never be able to worship in. Um, all that's just really strange to me how different it would have been. Um, we're such a world nowadays of, you know, order it on Amazon and get it this afternoon. Um, the, the thought of waiting, you know, four or 500 years for your building to be finished, you know, just, I can't even comprehend it. An another, Did you go to the um, excuse me, as the number um, of church, of clergy started increase, the space at the end of the church, the um, apse, that was for um, the clergy became too small. So what, what you found was in the larger cathedrals, they started adding a dais called a, a bima um, at that end of the church, as you can see in this plan of the old St. Peter's. Um, so what this did was it you know, started extending the arms of the church. And as you can see, it starts to take on in order to get more people up there and expand that area of the church they put little additions on the side and you're starting to get that T shape. And you know that's what developed into the so-called Latin cross, which is the shape of most um, Western churches. And, and the arms are called the transept later. But as you can see, that's, you know, this is where it started and where it came from. Um, large cathedrals typically have many entrances and, and were designed as they got bigger and bigger. Um, I, when I've been to some of them that we've done, I, I was always trying to figure out why we had to come in the side door or why they didn't have the grand entrance at the front of the church open. And um, the, the reason for that is, is that they got bigger and bigger. Um, the processional doors became the ones that they would open only during um, major events for a grand procession when that procession became part of the lit liturgy and, and um, you know, became part of the whole church service. So the people came in the sides and, and um, the pastor, the priest or whatever in group would come up to the middle. And, you know, as you can see from this one too, you know, most um, churches are in the cruciform floor plan and in Western um, tradition, but, and the plan is lo longitudinal. Um, the other form um, that started to come was from the Orthodox Church. The Eastern Orthodox Churches tended to be in the shape of a Greek cross. Um, the most famous of these is um, Hagia Sophia, which is in Istanbul. Um, the cathedral was designed by a Greek architect, actually, and was built by the Emperor Justinian in 537 which was the, the, was the world's largest space and among the first buildings to employ a fully pendentive dome 
Um, that means that the dome was actually completely round and sitting on a square base. Um, this daring huge design, dome actually changed the future of architecture. I mean, this is, this is the one of the most important architectural buildings, not only for looks or anything, but, but so many things were um, new and, and built um, in, in this structure. Sophia um, remained um, the world's largest building, I mean, the largest space and the largest building for over a thousand years. So when this thing was built, um, you know, in, in 537, you know, the daringness of everything that was done to support that building, I mean, there weren't any computer programs. Um, you know, you built a little um, model and just hoped that the big one stood up and, and held up. Um, and, you know, and then again, sadly, in 1453, Constantinople fell um, to the Ottoman Empire and it was converted into a mosque. Um, but the impact that this has had is, has gone on into the 21st century. Um, and, the, you know, it had the most impact on Eastern churches, but also on some of the Western churches. I mean, St. Peter's um, dome is based on and very similar to this dome. When we talk about um, cathedrals, I mean, most of us think that, you know, think Gothic and Renaissance cathedrals. So, um, you know, what is Gothic architecture? Um, I think the best way to describe this and for you maybe to remember it is that Gothic architecture is, is called pointed architecture. You know, it's a style of architecture that's pop pop popular in the um, 12th and through about the 16th century um, in most parts of Europe. And it, re it remained popular until the 17th or 18th century you know, none of these styles actually, you know, like end on a day or, you know, start at a certain time. Um, and it, it evolved from Romanesque architecture and was succeeded by Renaissance architecture. Um, the first two true Gothic churches um, were built in France. That's where it started and for a long time until the word, word Gothic, um, you know, was made popular. It was really just called French architecture. But there was a desire for the cathedrals to get, you know, taller and larger and bigger. Um, and the architects um, had tried, but couldn't really find a way to, to um, get the scale they were looking for without the building collapses, collapsing. I mean, the walls, when you get that tall, built out of stone with no support, can only go so far before they're just going to collapse. And there, there were a few disasters. Um, you know, there, there weren't any engineers around to solve some of these problems. Um, I think everybody's aware of like the Leaning Tower of Pisa. That, that tower started leaning um, almost instantly um, right away. I mean, it was just not built on solid ground or, or rock and started leaning almost right away. And, and, you know, I have never researched this, but there's a story I heard in school, that the architects buried under it, <laughs> that nobody was happy when, um, the, the tower started leaning almost right away. The, the defining um, element for Gothic architecture, you know, besides the pointed arch, the other main features is the innovation of the flying buttress. Um, the use of this pointed arch in turn led to the development of a pointed rib vault that I'll show you later. Uh, and the innovation of the flying buttress you know, it allowed for the elaborate tracery and the stained windows to come in. They finally could open up the walls um, and, and let the light in. Um, it just totally changed the architecture with this one structural idea. Um, this was a huge change to the worship space. Um, I think it's hard for us to even understand how dark and, and cold and dreary uh, these first churches were, especially before um, you could open up and put in the big windows. Um, there was no, hardly any natural light in the first cathedrals, um, no heat, you know, a few candles. Um, it, it's in our, you know, way of life, it's just hard, I think, for us to even understand, um, you know, how dreary they were till this happened. And what this allowed was the flying buttress is a support that comes out to the side. And so that center wall, um, on each side of the nave can go up, you know, much taller and thinner and have openings in it because you've got these other um, buttresses that are actually holding that wall up. 
the, the most famous Gothic cathedral probably in the world is, is, that everybody knows about is, is Notre Dame. Um, it, it's one that I think everybody in the world knows about and um, it's the most famous, but the Duomo in Italy and, and, and I mean, in, in France, I'm not sure to say that either, never did. They're, they're two of the best examples of Gothic architecture. Um, this is um, the Duomo in Milan, and um, this is Amiens in France. Um, you know, Amiens is probably the best example of Gothic architecture, and that it was built um, between 1220 and 1270. Um, that's a remarkably short time compared to all the other cathedrals that were built. And so because it was built in that short time, it's purely of one style. I mean, what happened to almost all the other um, buildings that, you know, they've been around for thousands of years and as styles changed, if one of the um, um, towers wasn't finished or something like that, somebody might come along and completely change it so that the buildings, you know, so many of them are, are mixes of different styles. In, in this um, cathedral, the architect was trying to maximize the internal dimensions in order to reach for the heavens um, on the, on the um, height of this building. And um, I think what it's, I found interesting about this building, I haven't been here, um, but you don't get the scale of it all that two Notre Dames, Notre Dames would fit inside of this building. It's that big. And, and I have been in Notre Dame and, and it, it's huge. I mean, I can't even comprehend how much bigger this one is. But um, while not the most famous is, is Notre Dame, Saint-Chapelle is, is my favorite church. Um, it, it is you know, on the top of my list. Um, it's in Paris. And um, it's one of the first churches that was done with this slender, small of a columns. Um, cylindrical columns where they were able to open up the walls this wide to almost have, it's almost like a glass, it's just a jewel case. I mean, it's just, when you go in, it's just sort of overwhelming. And I don't know of another cathedral um, that was built with this much glass in it at the time. Um, the stained glass windows, I could do a lesson on those. Um, they had to come out during the war. I mean, the original ones are still there. It's, it's just an incredible space. And, um, you know, it, it was a real breakthrough in architecture too. Um, that shot on what's um, the right side of my computer is um, looking up towards the ceiling at the um, ribbed vaults that are up there. Um, just beautiful, but you know, the, the, I thought this was interesting that um, the building was built by Louis the um, 14th to house his collection of um, the Christ relics. Um, this included the crown of thorns and 30 other reliquary items that Louis purchased, um, the passion um, relics. He purchased them from the emperor of Constantinople um, for the sum of 135 livres. And that's equal to one pound of silver. He then had a silver chest built to hold all these items. And the silver chest um, was said to have cost 100,000 livres. Well, the only reason I'm throwing those numbers out was I was let down when I found out the cost of those items at you know, 235,000 livres were, were so much more. The entire chapel with all the stained glass was only 40,000 livres. So he paid you know, three times that to get the crown of thorns, which that may have been worth it. Um, but the silver box, you know, cost um, more than twice what the whole building cost to, to house these things. The Thorn of Crowns was later moved to Notre Dame and, and kept there um, in, you know, when that was built at, you know, and in the major cathedral. And it was the first thing, as I understand it, that was removed from Notre Dame when, they, um, when the fire broke out. That was the first thing they went in to get and, and it was saved, they were able to get it out. Another thing about the Gothic architecture that I've always been impressed with, um, if you've ever get a chance or if you've ever been up on the roof 
Um, I've always been amazed at the things you can see up there that were not, I don't think they were meant to be seen by anybody because nobody would be up there except for somebody working on the roof. You can't see them from the ground. And it's, to me, it's an example of, you know, these buildings were built to the glory of God and, and every inch of them had to be perfect and beautiful. And, you know, maybe they thought only God could see these things up there, but it's just amazing to see the work and detail that are, that's done that was not even meant to be seen. So moving on to the Renaissance, which is sort of the next big, big phase of architecture. Um, th these cathedrals and churches, you know, started to replace the Gothic ones. And in some of the original cathedrals, as I mentioned, like Notre Dame, um, they were modified so much that they're really kind of a mix of both the Gothic and Renaissance. Um, Renaissance period is, you know, considered to be from the 14th to about the 16th century and overlapped the Gothic. Um, the main feature of the Renaissance movement was a revival of, of building elements from Greek and Rome. They were bringing back more of the um, column tops and the order that had been in the, in the Greek and Roman buildings. The, the first cathedral to be classified as truly Renaissance um, is this one in, in Pisa. It was designed by Brunicelli um, and is in Florence, Italy. I'm, I said Pisa, it's in Florence. And um, Brunicelli actually won a competition that was to, he did the dome, but it was designed the dome, but he, he won the competition with his dome and the competition was to basically put a roof on this monster giant structure that had already begun construction. Um, the um, layout of the church and everything had already been begun, but nobody had completely designed or figured out how to get a roof on this huge space. The, the style quickly spread throughout Italy and, and then obviously on to other parts of, the, uh, of Europe. Um, another thing that separated and, and was um, begun in the Renaissance period was these absidal chapels. Um, what they started doing was with the basic church plan, I don't know if you can see my error, but these um, chapels, they started adding onto the back of the church. That had started in the in the Renaissance period and had not been done in Gothic. And you'll even see churches where, you know, this is a, I'm sorry, this is um, one of the chapels to the right, but you'll even see like where they've added a chapel on a chapel. They just sort of um, kept adding these apses on, on the, you know, that end of the church. Yeah, and, and some of those were added as people gave enough money, which, you know, is not unusual um, you, you'd buy yourself a chapel or a place for you to be buried and, and have it built with your family name on it. So it's, you know, more and more people want to get there, um, show their wealth within the church. The best known Renaissance cathedral um, is probably um, the rebuilt St. Peter's um, Basilica in Rome. I say rebuilt um, because this church was um, replaced the basilica that had been on the site for over a thousand years. I mean, it was a huge uh, cathedral that was there, but the walls had started to lean enough that the Pope said, you know, we've got to do something. And so the thought of tearing down a thousand year old um, cathedral um, took a lot of convincing, but, but it was finally done. And they begun um, work on the St. Peter's as, as we know it today. And, um, there were actually a number of architects. There were four or five different architects that ended up working on this building um, before it was finished, you know, including Raphael and Michelangelo who designed different parts of this. Other important Renaissance buildings um, include St. Paul's in London. Um, I think it's interesting that um, St. Paul's was also the tallest building for hundreds of years. Um, it just, you know, when these were built, it's just crazy that to me that, you know, nothing for years um, even got close to the, the majesty of these things. The, the other big one from that period is the uh, cathedral in Granada, Spain, um, which 
we have, I have been to my wife and I, and when you come in and see this, all the gold and the beauty and this um, altar piece, it just, I'm, I'm, it blows your mind. <laughs> it just, I remember we just stood there with our mouths open forever. It, it just, it's just crazy beautiful. Well, the story of the Bible in that altar. Yeah. That's, yes. that's because the people were illiterate. And so they invested in this as the way to, to to educate the people and illustrate for the people the Bible itself. You know, the, the church is full of symbolism and um, as for, as I keep jumping all over the place, you know, I could spend more than the whole hour just to talking about symbolism in the church, but um, I'm, I'm gonna highlight just a, a few items. Um, church architecture, always been important as an educational purpose, as Megan was just saying. Um, but it was especially important in this period, you know, when, when hardly anybody could read, nobody, nobody even owned a picture, nobody, pe there were people who'd never seen a painting, I mean, or been in a big room like this. I mean, you figure people are living in one or two room homes, they have nothing, you know, but candles. I mean, it's, it's, for me, it's hard to get my mind ar um, around what it was like to, to experience a cathedral or to see stained glass or to see a carving for the first time in your life um, for, for the masses. I mean, nobody had experienced anything like this. Um, you know, when, when I'm touring, I, I tend to just pass by so many of these things and so many of the carvings and, and don't even look to understand, you know, what the stories are or, or what they're really trying to represent. Um, so, so I'm out of page here. <laughs> I'm out of sync. Hold on, I'm coming. I'm missing a piece of, I'm sorry, but I've, I've missed, I've lost my notes, but you know, the tempenium, 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 my, <laughs> my wife keeps been correcting me for days now and I still can't say it. You know, th this was um, typically um, told the story of Christ it may have shown, um, you know, what the afterlife could be like. It, it was, it was to show that you're stepping, you know, from um, the outside world into the world, and to remind you, um, as you pass by daily or whenever, um, that what you do here on earth can affect, you know, what may happen in the next life. Um, you know, the, the design. I'm going from memory now. Um, you know, the, the layout of the church was to, um, you know, have order. The idea that order is is um, of, of extreme importance. Uh, all right, we're back. Sorry. <laughs> so, so, you know, and the education started the minute you put your foot into the church. You know, the, the, the goal of the design was, was to have symmetry. You know, having both sides of the building mirror one another, create an organized and unified look. You know, the thought was that, the, you know, that that was perfect and divine things are perfect and orderly. You know, just the, just, you know, thus the church building um, should reflect, you know, that perfection uh, and, you know, the divine um, unity. So for centuries, the church was built in the shape of the, you know, Christian cross, and therefore it makes sense that the holiest location was reflected in that, in that shape. The cross resembles the shape, you know, somewhat the shape of a person as well, and the comparison is also used in the church and church architecture. You know, the narthex is the foot of the church or the person, and the apse would be the head. So the entrance of the church is typically located on the west side. You entered it through the narthex, 
And it's the symbolic um, where the foot touches the ground. You know, the Western face is the point where the transition from the outside material world to that divine world um, in the church. Most of the symbolic item, you know, items inside the church, you know, are subtle and often missed. You know, there's traditionally three doors on, on the front of the narthex. You see it all the time. You know, th these three doors are to reflect and, and, you know, the belief in the Trinity. There's usually three, you know, major elements on the front of most churches. On the west facade, you know, there are two towers, the piece in the middle. These also, you know, represent the Trinity. You know, little things just show up, you know, throughout the whole design. Um, when you pass through the door, you know, and the transition from the mundane to the sacred, you know, it's to remind people of this. You know, those, those decorations over the door, um, you know, the image of heaven. You know, the, the, you could have the final judgment over the door, you know, so that as you went through, as I mentioned, you, you're, you're, you know, recognizing that you're mortal. You know, you walk through the church into, you know, into the narthex, and then you enter that largest part of the church, the nave. You know, you've got that vaulted area of the church. You know, th this represents the body, and uh, you know, symbolically. And, and the nave, you know, has that tall ceiling that's reaching for the sky. You know, it's designed to make you feel it soaring towards heaven. You know, after traveling that length to the nave, you know, you're going to reach the transept, you know, the arms. Um, if you think of it as a person, you know, this is as far as the ordinary person could go um, during, you know, the, the period we're talking about when these churches were built. Um, the rest of the church um, that you equate to the head was off limits. I mean, there typically was a screen or a hanging that, that blocked the view of that from the um, public. Um, you know, in front of the screen is where the altar was. And this is where the priest performed, you know, the ceremonies. Unlike today, where the priest would typically face you in the congregation, the medieval priest um, would have had his um, back to you, and he'd be facing the altar, you know, away from the congregation. Um, this put his and your focus on the holiest part of the church, the asp that was actually behind the screen. The altar, you know, in shape, um, typically um, was a cube, which connotes uh, Christ's tomb. Baptismal fonts, you know, are often octagonally shaped, and, and the eight sided of, sides of the font are meant to recall the eighth day, the first day of resurrection. You know, when you see a circle in the church, you know, it signifies God, you know, eternal and ever, everlasting, um, as a circle, you know, has no beginning and end. Um, you can, you know, you know, you see like a rose window. You don't think of that, but the circle in that is meant to represent that, and the circles within the circle. The dome typically was trying to um, be designed to connote heaven. You know, if you look at the decorations and the colors and things on the roof and ceiling, um, you know, stars, whatever. Sometimes, you know, they're, they're meant to um, to connote heaven. Um, even every color in the church has a, has a significant meaning. meaning. Um, we talked about this some before in one, on Peggy's um, presentation of the pictures, or maybe that was Hunter's. But, um, you know, everything that's painted in the church is painted that color for a reason. Red typically symbolizes strength, love, martyrdom. You know, it's also the symbol for fire when you see it in the church. Yellow means consistency of wisdom but it can also um, mean envy. Blue is um, for faith and loyalty and heavenly contemplation. Green is symbolic of hope, fidelity, and immortality. Purple's typically reserved, um, was, was and is reserved for the bishop or royalty. White um, represents light, faith, and innocence. Gray, brown, they're usually the colors of penitence pen, and um, humility. And um, black is for sorrow and death and sin. And gold is the hue of the heaven for, you know, was used for the heavenly glory and for brightness. So, you know, you see a color in the church. It's not that somebody usually decided, oh, I like that color. Um, you know, Benjamin Warren's got it on sale. You know, let's put that up. 
Um, you know, they're, they're, they're picked for a reason. Everything in the church, you know, those are just a few of the items, but everything in the church um, has some symbolic meaning. Moving on, um, I wanted to spend a minute and talk or a little while and talk about church steeples. Um, you know, they're, they're thought of typically as being on top of the um, church. That's how we picture them. But, you know, mostly nowadays that's where they are. But, you know, originally and, and quite often still, um, they were a separate tower. Um, they, they were, you know, referred to as a tower. Um, there's two theories really on why we have steeples or towers um, that became associated with the um, with our church, you know, with religion. You know, where did they come from? Why do we have them? So some, some people say they're derived um, over time from obelisk. Um, there are many churches that have them, um, you know, whether on top or out front or whatever. I mean, including here at St. Peter's, you can see it um, with the cross on top. And the obelisk dates back to um, basically the worship of the pagan sun, um, pagan sun god, Ra. Um, those were the first obelisks that anybody really is aware of, and they think that's when they started. And for him, they really were a symbol of fertility, and people worshipped him um, for the god Ra and fertility. Um, it's found on, you know, the obelisk is found on almost every continent of the world. And, you know, they were there long before the church started using them. Um, I did find one scholarly paper um, doing some research for this that found it very strange and really wrong that we have these things that were basically um, pagan worship pieces, you know, on our church property these days. The other theory um, is that they grew out of the design from military watchtowers, um, which might have had a bell or a, you know alarm in them, as well you know as as those in our church do. Um, the buildings don't exist anymore, but the first mention of a bell tower associated with the church um, was about the fifth century. There are some writings that talk about um, a church um, at Nola that that had the first bell tower, and then they're repeatedly mentioned in eighth century writings. So even though a lot of these eighth century churches are, are gone, um, we know they had bell towers. And the first ones are really modest. I mean, they may have been very simple, um, separate structures from the church, but over time they you know, were incorporated into the church building and capped you know, ever more and, you know, elaborately and got fancier and fancier until they um, had a, a steeple on top as we know it. Um, the oldest one we know that's still standing is um, the massive one at Chartres Cathedral in France, um, which is just outside um, Paris. Only one of those is the original. Um, the other one, as you can see, is quite different and was added later. Um, they slowly made their way to America. Um, it seems that Christopher Wren um, seems to have brought the, the um, steeple that we think of as um, ubiquitous on, um, you know, modern churches. Um, the one thing I do find strange is that the number of modern churches that um, have dropped them and don't have them, um, I find it really strange that some of the mega churches look more like Costco than they do um, they, uh, any sort of church that I'm familiar with. So, you know, I think there's three reasons, really, um, that we have the steeples. You know, the vertical lines of the steeple helped us visually enhance the lines of the church, you know, and they direct your viewer's eye vertically towards the heavens. And um, secondly, remember, for many years, um, the masses, no, no one had clocks for the longest time. Um, there was no well, way to know when something was happening. So these many of the towers that contain bells were used to, you know, to call everything from the church service to weddings, to funerals, and, and often maybe even alerting people that there was a crisis within the town. Um, you know, the church bell became, you know, it was the clock or the, you know, to let you know something was happening for a long time. And, um, you know, I think for us here in America and other places, 
the steeple as we think of it, you know, when you couldn't afford a large cathedral, the, the steeple coming up taller than the other buildings around them could be seen from most anywhere in the city a lot of times when the buildings were low and you, you knew where the church was. So it was kind of like having the tower or the major cathedral um, only on a much smaller scale. You know, First Press, our, our tower, um, you know, is, is um, similar to all the Gothic towers we were just looking at, but not all of the towers, especially in um, warm climates or the south were built to be bell towers. Um, a lot of them were actually, um, not only for the look, but they discovered that they could act as a chimney. You could open the tower doors and open the windows and the tower would help suck the air, the warmer air up through the tower and out through the louvers and create some circulation. So in hot climates, um, you know, it was a way to get some air movement within the church and our windows, we, we, you know, ours functioned this way for a long time. When we finally put the bells in, um, there was a lot of structural work done to actually um, get the bells in there because it was never designed to really hold heavy bells. A little bit um, history on our church, you know, I'm sure most of you probably know this, but um, we were founded as a church on the Elizabeth River, um, actually before we were a nation. I mean, we go back to 1678, there's records of um, some Presbyterian Scots who were meeting in their homes in Norfolk about that time. Um, the records indicate that First Presbyterian Church continued from 7, 1678 to 1716. Then there's this weird part where there's no records of the church for 85 years. You, you need to read about that. That's on our website and there's some explanation for that. In 1805, there's records that show, this is when we show back up, a Presbyterian pastor from Philadelphia um, came down and he found a group of organized people, it says, meeting in the borough of Norfolk. And he was invited to take charge. You know, this is all in writing. So, in, you know, the group finally erected a building in 1802, our first real church. And it was on the corner of Bank Street and Charlotte Street, which is down near um, the MacArthur Mall. Um, and the street names actually changed but it was known as the Bell Church. And it was known for that because at the time it was the only church in the city with a bell. Um, this was torn down at some period long ago as they were redeveloping downtown. But as the congregation grew, um, we needed a larger church. And so in 1835, work began on a, on a new Presbyterian church that was built on um, Church Street. It was on the site of an old Episcopal church that had burned down a few years before. And uh, the new church was interesting, 62 by 86. And it was described as having a facade of classical Greek proportions based on a building on the Acropolis. Uh, this too has been torn down in, um, off of Church Street. So then on to ours, in 1901, um, First Presbyterian Church um, began in, you know, looking for a new place to meet. They're, they had outgrown the church on Church Street and a number of people in Ghent had started a um, house, um, a, home, a home church. And so they were meeting there. And so in 1901, a group from a Bible class, the Brotherhood Bible class started a movement and, and actually um, got permission to buy the land. And they, that group, um, the Bible class, raised the money to buy the first lots. And the first organization for that church um, in 1901 had 39 charter members. They raised enough money and started construction on our, on our building in 1911. And the congregation was made up of both First Presbyterian Church and Ghent, Ghent, um, Ghent Presbyterian Church. My wife's telling me to hurry up. Um, I thought it was interesting that um, our building cost $70,000, you know, in 1911 to build. The Sunday school edition later cost $15,000. Strange to me today that people are driving cars that cost more than our church to build. Um, the difference in money nowadays. Um, 
you know, the building was practically paid for it's under, I understand um, in what I read and the newspaper in 1912 said that our congregation couldn't decide whether to sell the building on Church Street or to use it for missions. And they did use it for missions for a while. And that kind of appealed to me that our, our mission roots run really deep. There's a few things about the architect I want to share. Um, out of time. Um, you know, he, he, he lived yeah. from 1875 to 36. He attended the academy, Hampton, Sydney, and then he got his architectural degree at MIT. But I think what I learned that I thought was really um, important was his, his impact that he had, you know, besides designing our church, um, which I, I do want to read. Um, it's interesting, the newspaper, when our church was dedicated, said that it was designed in the late perpendicular period of the Gothic style and plan and followed the, the um, precedents of the English. The main feature of the exterior is, of course, the tower, which was designed to give an impression of stability, dignity, and repose. The interior varies from the usual Presbyterian plan, chiefly in the arrangement of the pulpit and the seats for the elders. The reading desk on, on which the Bible rests is the axis and the, of the plan and the focal point to which all lines of the church approach. In these features, the church follows the idea of the Presbyterian churches of Scotland. There, yeah. thought that was a great reading for us. What I wanted to add quickly about our um, architect is not only did he do our building, but he really designed what I think of as Ghent, you know, proper. He designed not only our church, but he did um, Second Presbyterian Church, which later became the Unitarian Church which is um, now empty. I think it's for sale again. And that was done in the Gothic revival style. He did our church. He also did Al Shalom Synagogue right around the corner with his firm. And he did St. Andrew's Church, which is over in um, West Ghent. He designed um, Ghent Methodist Episcopal, which is now Ghent United Methodist. Um, right around the corner from ours. And he also did Sacred Heart. So if you think about the major historic buildings in, in Ghent, um, he's really, he and his firm are, are responsible for these. The other thing he um, designed that is of great importance, I think, is he did the Royster Building. Um, it was the tallest building in Norfolk for 50 years, you know, which had a big impact on, on Norfolk. And then he did this other building at William and Mary. And with that, I'll um, wrap it up. Cathedral design is like Picasso, working with Einstein. It involves art, design, engineering, and science. That's it. Awesome, Mike. Thank you so much. Could you, could you say the name of the architect that, that uh, worked on our church and all these other buildings in the area? Um, it was Ferguson. Ferguson. Yeah. Awesome. Thank you so much. Just so much information and so awesome. Um, so just a couple questions. Um, one is it, it seems that the architecture of the church building also speaks to represents the theology of the church. Mm -hmm. our, ch our church building or at all church buildings. And, um, okay, hang on. I mean, it was all based on, I mean, that's how the design of the church grew, was out of the theology of the church. I mean, as they, you know, needed spaces for certain things, the buildings were adapted and, and, and built to handle it. Awesome, awesome. Why do you think people thought they wanted to build a church around 1900 to look like a Gothic church? I, I think because of the, the um, permanence that kind of building has to people. You know, I think people think of um, those kind of buildings because they've been around for a thousand years. That, and, and that's what people think a church ought to look like. You know, if I think of a church, I think of a cathedral. I mean, that's why I have trouble with churches looking like Costco. <laughs> oh, you know, our yeah. church, I think there was the Scottish influence. You know, that that's what the churches in Scotland had looked like. Um, question about um, 
scale, the Dumo and Notre Dame. Curious about the scale between those two. Um, the Duomo in Milan? I think so. In, yeah. in, in um, Florence? Yes. Which? I don't know. Oh, I don't either. Um, Notre Dame is the biggest of, of okay. the. The one in, no, the one in Milan, the Duomo in Milan is bigger. Okay. Okay. Great. Great. Sorry, I'm everybody's saying this is great. This is great. You need to teach another class. Um, and um, I they were awake. They wrote that early, I'm sure. <laughs> yeah. No, later, like you know, five minutes ago. And one is one was a suggestion of maybe the history of uh, Norfolk architecture might be fun. So, yeah, we're gonna. Um, it was really hard as I did this. You know, I jumped all over the place and over many centuries. Um, just trying Washington to highlight some of the that. fun. Emily Washington. Emily could Washington could do one. We do have one coming up um, that everybody who's on this, if you enjoyed this at all, um, Peggy Mackey is going to do one on stained glass. And yeah. stained oh, glass. Yeah. And, yeah. and I think that's going to appeal to a lot of people. Yeah. It's going to be really good. I've heard so, it. Mike, this is Stephen Cook. So, um, did you ever see the um, PBS documentary? And you can find it online on um it's called the medici 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 family the godfathers of the renaissance it talks about the story of the building of the duomo in florence yeah. that you talked about it oh, is fascinating if you like murder <laughs> <laughs> the medicis were notorious for all kinds of things yeah oh you've got to watch that it's on online oh, no. they're the ones that built the bridge so they could secretly get across you know i know <laughs> what was it called again the godfathers of the renaissance okay. medicis you can find it online it's an hour mike i would love to hear a presentation on the one that's in uh, barcelona spain that has been being built for how many years now the, oh, the the, oh, the yeah. Gaudi building. Yes, yes. You know, that's one that's so funny because you know I've been a couple times and when 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 you see the thing and everybody's standing around going when will they finish it? I'm going it's young compared to the other cathedrals. Yeah, um, it's one. It's it's a it's a. Um, I'm trying to think what the style is now, but um, you know it's it's a surealist almost. Like you know, it's it's by Gaudi, and, and they've it's been working on castle style. <laughs> yeah, yeah, it looks like a drip castle, and and you know they they just you know the church doesn't have the money that it had in the day when these other cathedrals were built, and so they raise a little money and they put on you know part of the church, but you know it's it doesn't even have a roof yet. Plus, the architect died in poverty. Yeah. died on the street. We all died. And they didn't him. know who he even was when they found him. He was mm -hmm. hit by a, yeah. a, some something and died yeah. there on the street. They didn't know who he was. Wow. Wow. Mike, this has been awesome. I think um, I think you've been recruited to teach another class. So I hope uh, I hope you will do that. It's been so, so informative. So thank you.